Okay, everybody. Welcome to my little thing on exposure. And uh, specifically, we'll be talking a lot about manual exposure. So I'm Lauren Fisher. I've been a professional photographer since 1978. And I mentioned that because in 1978, you couldn't buy a camera that had automatic exposure. Everything was manual. So I learned the hard way. So thought tonight we'd start with the basics of exposure. And there we go. The exposure, oh, there we go. The exposure triangle. So to get a proper exposure, it's a combination of shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So shutter speed is how long your shutter stays open or how fast it is. Aperture is the opening of your lens, how big the opening is. And ISO is how sensitive your sensor is or film if you're using film. Um, so if you have a proper exposure and change any one of those three, your exposure is gonna be off. But you could adjust one of the other two to get it back into proper exposure, but uh, uh, we okay. want to think about exposure as a combination of those three. Now, I tend to shoot pretty much everything at ISO 100 because it gives me the best quality possible, and uh, and and I make big prints, so I need the best quality I can get. So basically, I set my ISO okay. and forget it. If, uh, if you're not as concerned about quality as I am, which a lot of people aren't, uh, you know, maybe ISO 400 for most things during the day, you're, you're fine and it'll still look really, really good. So then you only have to worry about two things, aperture and shutter speed, right? So, so uh, I'm going to mute everybody here, get that going. And if you want to make a comment or say something, uh, just uh, hold down the key or your uh, space bar on your keyboard if you're using a desktop computer or you can just click your un, unmute but uh, we'll keep everybody muted here um so basically your camera has a light meter built into it and the light meter simply measures how much light is entering the camera and it is measuring the light that is being reflected off of whatever scene your camera is pointed at so it doesn't matter where your camera is it matters where the light is falling on the subject. So if your camera is in the shade, it doesn't matter if the subject is out in the sunshine. It's not going to affect your exposure. Right? So it's all about what the light is reflected off the subject. And so your meter is looking at many different things in your in your uh, in, in the scene. And so it's looking at the highlights or the brighter part of the picture. And um, it is evaluating all the tonal values in the scene. So it's evaluating the highlights. It's looking at the shadows, which are the darker parts of the picture. And it's looking at the midtones, which are the middle tones of the scene, right? So the, the grays, the in-between tones, between the shadows and the highlights. So then it uses all of these tonal values and averages them out to set a standard. And that standard is an 18% gray. So it wants everything to look at like 18% gray. So uh, if you were taking a picture of a foggy scene like this, that's what your meter wants every picture to look like. It wants it to be that tonal value, that gray. We don't want that, but the camera does. So even when the tones in the scene are dark, like my black cat, the meter wants to turn them into 18% gray. And so it is going to tell you to take an exposure that is too bright. And the, your cat, your black cat will come out as a gray cat. My cat was black, not gray. And uh, same thing happens on the other side. If you take a picture of something bright like snow or uh, a bright sunny day on a beach, sandy beach, it's going to tell you, nope, that needs to be gray, not white. And it's gonna give you an exposure 
that says make it gray. Okay. So in that case, you need to actually overexpose what the camera is telling you. Now it doesn't make a lot of sense when you, unless you really think about it. But uh, you know, it, it it does. You know, if it, if it's coming out gray, you want it to be white. You have to add more light, right? So it's a little little confusing at first, but uh, once you get the hang of it, it's it's a truism, All right? So very persnickety photographers carry around a gray card and it's 18% gray, right? And they will place that card in the same light as their subject and then take a meter reading off of that card. This is, these are pretty small cards, but, but they work. And if you do that, you're guaranteed a proper exposure, right? But very few of us bother to carry around gray cards and go place them in the scene and do a meter reading off of it and then run back to your camera and then figure it all out. And so uh, so we won't do that, but we will talk about first the different metering modes that your camera has. Um, and this is how this is the different ways the camera will evaluate the scene. And so you have basically three different ways, evaluative or matrix, uh, center weighted or spot. So evaluative or matrix depends on what camera brand you have, what they call it. Um, but the evaluative, um, so there's what they will look like. You'll find them in a menu or someplace in your, on your, uh, there might be a shortcut button for it, but it'll be, your metering mode will be in your camera somewhere. And so evaluative, basically looks at the whole scene, the entire frame, and it uses all the tones in that scene and uh, evaluates what it should be and comes down to that 18% gray. A uh, center-weighted metering mode will only evaluate the center of your picture. Uh, how much that is depends on your camera, again, but it, it's basically taking a, a circle of like that and uh, using that to evaluate your exposure. And then there's the spot metering, which is a very tight spot. And again, depending on the camera, uh, you can move the spot around or you can just do it in the center and then remember. So if you were carrying gray cards around, you'd use a spot metering mode and put the gray card in the scene where where the light's hitting it the same as your subject and use that spot and and uh, get the light right off of the subject. Um, again, I'm usually too lazy to be that exact. Uh, I, in fact, I don't even carry gray cards anymore. I used to, but I don't anymore. But if I was photographing products or, or something that the exposure had to be exact, exact, yes, I would be uh, using the, a gray card to not only get the exposure right, but the color balance would be right too. Um, but I don't do that kind of photography anymore, so I'm out in the field. And when I'm out in the field, I need to rely on uh, my camera and the different evaluate the different exposure modes. So uh, a scene like this, when I'm using the evaluative or the, the matrix, uh, and again, that's taking in the cameras using the whole picture to evaluate the tonal values. It's going to see that white wall that's behind this woman and say, nope, that's not supposed to be white, that's supposed to be gray, and and move move your exposure to the dark side. So when that happens, uh, her face is too dark, right? Along with everything else. So if I was using a center weighted, I would get a closer exposure because it's only gonna look at a little bit of the wall, but a lot of her skin also, and between the two, it's probably going to come to a pretty close uh, exposure, all right? Um, now, if she moved to the left or the right side of the frame, and you're using the center metering, your exposure is going to be off again, because it's reading that wall only, and uh, the wall is white, and it's going to say, camera's going to say, ah, nope, not white, we want it gray. So you're going to be way off again, okay? Just like it was with the snow. It's going to turn it to 18% gray. So if you used a spot 
it would zoom in on a tight area. Uh, right now, it'd be in on her on her hair, her face, her earring. And again, that's probably not going to be right because that's pretty dark. So it's going to make the whole picture overexposed because it can try to make those dark areas 18% gray, right? So what you would need to do if you wanted a perfect exact uh, um, exposure is find a place in the scene that has a va tonal value that's about 18% gray. Now, 18% gray does not mean it has to be gray color. It can be a any color, but the, the tonal value would be equivalent to 18% gray. So this area right under her, uh, the ruffle on her blouse in the shadow, that's about an 18% gray. So if you're using a spot meter, you move that spot meter down there and that would give you a, a pretty darn close uh, exposure. Now, when I'm photographing people or anything moving, am I bothering to pull out the, to switch my mode to spot meter and find that exact spot and get the exact right exposure? No, I'm not. People do and they get perfect exposures, but I, I'm more into the moment than the ex exposure. So um, I, I have learned that my camera lies to me all the time. And if I'm in a scene like this and the, the background is pretty bright, I know that I need to uh, overexpose what the camera's telling me to do. If I'm in a scene where everything's pretty dark, and we'll see some of those photos later, uh, I'm going to tell it, nope, make it brighter because, or, or make it darker than what it is to, uh, to compensate for that. So, um, in, in this case, you know, I, I keep mine on the evaluative or the matrix all the time. I very rarely change it. Um, and, and, uh, and most of the time I'm hitting my exposures because I'm shooting in manual and I can adjust quickly for that, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So here's where the manual exposure comes into play. Uh, looking at this scene, again, I knew right away, well, her face is kind of in the shadow. That wall behind her is pretty bright. The exposure the camera is telling me is not going to be good for her face. So I immediately uh, changed my uh, Aperture, I opened it up to let more light in. Now, if you remember back to the exposure triangle, I could have changed the shutter speed or the ISO and done the same thing. But uh, uh, in this case, I, I changed my aperture because I didn't want to get a slower shutter speed and get movement from either her or the camera. So, um, uh, so the easiest way was just to change the shutter speed really quick. Um, again, I'm shooting in manual mode. Can I do this in, in one of the automatic modes? Yes. And we'll talk about that later. And we'll talk about why uh, the manual is still better. Okay. So again, another, another picture where the uh, meter said this should be the exposure. And I said, no, it needs to be a little bit brighter. So I opened up a little bit and uh, really was able to bring out his face. Um, so on a scene like this, if I'm thinking about which exposure mode to use, evaluative slash matrix, uh, center weighted or spot, uh, in this case, that scene is pretty evenly lit, right? So everything has, has, is uh, up, about the same value. So I'm going to stick with that evaluative or matrix and and let the camera read the whole scene and and in this case there's enough different lights darks and midtones that it's going to come really close to the proper exposure so i don't have to compensate for this one very much um, if i was if i was really fussy and wanted to hit it with the spot meter i would look for a place that's about 18 percent gray maybe in here maybe in here and meter off of that, and and that would be perfect. We're getting a little bit of sunlight out here, so it would, it would, it would probably make that too bright, but uh, we're even to, able to even it out. So again, depending on the light, any of the exposure modes can can work fine if you know what they're doing, if you think about what they're doing. So again, this is pretty even light. 
uh, it's got a lot of different uh, tonal values in the scene. So the evaluative or the matrix, the, the, the mode that's taking in the whole scene is going to come really, really close to giving you the right exposure. Now, this one's a little trickier because we have brighter light coming across on his face than on his face, but the overall scene is pretty evenly lit and it has light spots, it has darker spots, it has mid-tones. So your evaluative is gonna work here pretty well too. So again, I'm not gonna, especially when there's something with some timing going on, I'm not gonna be fussing around with changing my exposure mode to figure out what's the right exposure. Um, typically I do that in a scene like this, um, before anything happens. So I'm going to figure out what my exposure is before there's anything and I'm shooting in manual. So it doesn't matter where the people are in the scene. If they move a little bit, my exposure is not going to change. We're going to talk about that more in a, in a few minutes, but, uh, basically, uh, you know, I'm setting my exposure and I'm forgetting about it because the light's not changing. If the light's not changing, you know, then you don't have to worry about it. But when you get to a high contrast scene like this, then you have to figure out what's, what's, what's the right exposure, right? And what's the, do I expose for the bright clouds? Do I expose for the bright building? Do I expose for the shadows to get more detail? And so if you're using, uh, a center weighted, it's going to concentrate on this part of the scene. And if that's what's the most important to you, then that's great. If you're going for the evaluative, it's going to take into consideration the shadows, the brights, and everything else. And and uh, you're probably in this scene going to be a little bit overexposed. So uh, figuring it out is, is a, a bit tougher and and uh, again, a little later, we'll talk about some ways to uh, to compensate for that and and figure out what the right right exposure is. So, in in a scene like like this, you have to decide what is the most important to you. The uh, the the camera can't handle the dynamic range of the bright light on the wall behind it and the shadows on the car, right? So if you wanted a lot of detail in the car, you'd have to brighten your exposure, which is going to way overexpose the back and the kid, right? So I tend to let the shadows go dark and hold my highlights. I don't want my highlights to uh, blow out. I don't want the highlights to get too bright or uh, or I'm in trouble. You know, you can, you can a lot of times in post-processing, pull the shadows out and get some detail in them. Uh, but if your highlights are blown out, you can't get them back. There's nothing you can do. So you're in trouble. So I almost always let the shadows go dark and, and hold the exposure for the highlights. So again, I use the evaluative slash matrix mode uh, pretty much exclusively uh, because I know the meter is going to lie to me all the time anyway. Right, so I might as well just let it lie to me about the whole scene. Um, I use the meter reading as a suggestion of where to start, and then I compensate from there. Um, none of the none of the exposure modes are going to properly read this scene. There's just too much variation in light from uh, this guy's face being down and having uh, being in the shadow to the bright light on the buildings in the upper left corner, right? So uh, so I'm just going to kind of average that out for myself and and uh, go for an in-between setting from what the camera says to what I, I know is right or hope is right anyway. So as always, I wanna get my exposure as close as possible in the camera and not have to adjust it in post-processing. I rarely ad adjust the exposure in post-processing. Uh, I, I will definitely play with the blacks and the highlights and the whites and the shadows, but uh, hopefully not very often I'm 
I'm changing the exposure in post-processing because that messes up a whole lot of stuff. So you want to get it right from the start. And again, here, I was much more interested in the detail of, in the in the church than the detail in the people in the foreground, right? If if they were very, you know, if it was Beyonce walking past here, then I've got to brighten this up a whole bunch and I'm going to blow out the, the church, but, you know, she would be the, the money shot rather than the church. But in this case, I don't care about them. So let them go dark and, and uh, the church would be what my exposure is based on. Um, so frequently, uh, I have to bring down the highlights in post-processing and bring up the shadows because the dynamic range of the camera just can't handle all the brights and lights. So um, that's another reason to use ISO 100. You have a, a larger dynamic range than you do at farther up the scale. As you, as you get a bigger number of IS, on ISO, your dynamic range uh, is reduced. So dynamic range is, can the, can the camera handle physically handle the, the sensor physically handle the whites of the white like on the sheet and and the darks inside the door over here on the left um, newer cameras are getting longer uh, or wider dynamic ranges uh, so my guess in five years you'll have a camera that can handle both that and you still have detail inside the shadows like this uh, but right now I can't so I'm going you know I'm gonna let those highlights uh, hold the highlights, not blow them out and, and lose the shadows. Okay. So here's a case for spot metering, right? Uh, if, if I just, if I just let the camera evaluate this based on the, the entire scene, it's going to say, wait a minute, this all should be pretty gray, shouldn't it? And it's going to tell me to way overexpose this and, and I'm going to pick up a lot of tones in here, but I'm going to lose him. It's going to blow him out. So here, a spot meter reading right off of his pants is going to give you a pretty darn close uh, proper exposure. Um, so this one, this exposure was uh, almost three, three and a half stops darker than what the camera told me to do. So as soon as I saw this, I knew that doesn't matter what the camera says, I'm going to uh, darken my exposure. And, and make sure that I'm not blowing out those highlights. So when you get a scene like this, what do you do? Well, it's a creative decision. Um, this, you know, if I try to brighten this picture up so that I can see his face, everything else in the photo is going to be way too bright, right? So I let his face go into shadows, which adds a little bit of mystery to it. And that's okay. This guy was pretty missed. Uh, excuse me, guy was a pretty mysterious guy. He had uh, 12 wives and 25 kids. He's in Cuba. Um, and he had another kid on the way. So uh, he probably likes to be incognito a little bit. So let's talk about what do you do, what you do when the camera is lying to you, which it does all the time. They're, they're dirty two-faced liars, those cameras. Um, so if I'm shooting in manual exposure, um, it's a very quick spin of a dial that's right by my index finger to compensate for the exposure. My, my, uh, aperture button is right by the shutter button. And then the button for the, uh, shutter speed is right by my thumb. So while I'm holding the camera up, I can change my exposure. Uh, either using the aperture or the shutter speed. Again, I'd never change my ISO. Um, and auto ISO is the worst thing ever made. It should be banned. It is uh, uh, created by the devil. Uh, not that I have an opinion, but uh, get off of auto ISO, or at least limit it. Um, but if you're shooting with uh, one of the auto modes, aperture priority or shutter priority, um, then you need to go into your exposure compensation exposure compensation menu, and that takes a couple of button pushes. And uh, if you haven't seen your exposure compensation menu before, it's the looks like the scale here that's uh, has the colored bar around it. Um, 
and it, to the left is uh, minus one stop, minus two stops, minus three stops, making the picture darker by three stops. To the right is plus one, plus two, plus three stops, making the picture brighter. Um, that's fine if you're shooting landscapes and you have plenty of time. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but um, uh, the exposure compensation is going to look different depending on your camera. So you have to pull out your manual and figure out where exposure compensation is. Um, sometimes it's in a menu. Sometimes there's a little button that looks like this plus minus on the back of your camera. You hit that and it'll bring up your exposure compensation. But uh, uh, no matter what, unless you're really nimble with your camera, you have to pull the camera away from your face to do your exposure compensation. And uh, when you do that, if something's moving, you probably lost a shot. So if you're shooting manual exposure, you know those buttons are right there by your finger or your thumb. You can just spin them and and uh, and, and get the proper exposure. Um, so here's what I mean. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me for a sec. So this eagle is flying against a fairly dark background, right? So the meter is going to think that the scene is dark overall and tell you to brighten it up. Okay. Um, probably a stop or so. Well, I know that's not right. So I'm going to underexpose it from what the camera tells me to get a proper exposure. And it, since I'm in manual, I'm, I'm locked in on that. So I'm doing that without taking the camera away from my eye. I can do that while I'm shooting. Right. So if the, I don't remember what the exposure was, but say it was, uh, 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 let's figure it out. So F, F4 F at uh, one thousandth of a second, that's probably pretty close. So that's the proper light on the eagle, right? That's the proper light on the eagle. Doesn't matter what the background is doing. It's the eagle that I care about. So once he grabs his fish and he gets up into the sky, the sky is pretty bright. Now that camera is going to tell me, wait a minute, that's really a bright picture. Let's make it a lot darker. No, I know that my exposure on the bird is exactly the same as it was when it was down low with a dark background, right? Because the light on the bird is the same. doesn't matter what the background's doing. It's the bird that I care about. So if I was shooting in aperture priority, I would be fumbling around trying to find the proper exposure because the camera is now going to say it's a different exposure because the bird is against a different background. Well, it's not a different exposure on the bird. It's a different exposure on the background. I don't care about the background. So while some people are fumbling to, to change their exposure, I know the exposure is the same. So I've got it in manual. I'm not changing it as that bird's flying towards me. All I have to do is figure out how to get it in focus, right? And so uh, that's my number one reason that I hang on to manual exposure all the time is I don't have to fumble around and figure out how to compensate when, when especially when something moves from a different background, from a light background to a dark or a dark background to a light. Uh, as long as the light is the same on the subject, doesn't matter what the background was, right? Contemplate that for a while. So if you ever tried to photograph the moon, I'll bet you the first shots you took, the moon was a white blob, right? Because the camera is seeing uh, the moon usually smaller in the frame than this. And it's taking in all the black that's around it because it's nighttime. And it's saying, oh, that exposure needs to be pretty slow. Well, it's not. The, you know, the exposure on the moon, especially a full moon, is the, basically the same as the Earth at noon time uh, because what determines the brightness or luminance of anything is how bright the, the light source is and how far away the light source is. Well, the light source for the moon is the sun. Light source for the Earth is the sun. Same brightness essentially the same distance away the moon and, and the earth are from the sun 
So the exposure for a full moon is basically the same as uh, the exposure at noon here. Now, when the full moon when the moon first rises and there's haze on the horizon, it could be darker. But once it's up in the sky a little ways, it's always going to be the same. But if you try doing that with with aperture priority, it could be off six or eight stops. There's no way exposure compensation is going to adjust for six or eight stops. So you absolutely have to jump over to manual exposure at that point. If you don't, you're going to have a white white blob of a moon, right? So metering this scene, forget it, right? Because it's going to say, well, everything in there is just way too dark. You have to brighten it up. So what's it going to say? Brighten it all up, right? And overexpose it. And it's probably going to be overexposed by five, six, seven stops. You can't use auto exposure at all to compensate for that. You've got to jump over to, to manual. Now, how do I know what the proper exposure is? Well, I use what I call the BLH factor, a bracket like hell, meaning I change my exposures for every shot. So something that's not moving like this, I can shoot five or six different photos at different exposures, and then I know one of them is going to be right. You know, if it's three three stops underexposed, two stops under what the camera's telling me, you know. Um, do I do I check my screen on the back of the camera for uh, exposure? No, not much. Um, the histogram is fairly worthless uh, on your camera or anywhere for determining exposure. It will tell you if you are if if your highlights are too white or your shadows are too dark. But on a scene like this, both of those are happening right now. Our shadows are too dark. We have no detail in there. So it's going to say, oh, you're you're blocking up your shadows. That's bad. And it's going to say these white lines are too white, which they are, but I don't care. Right. So in this case, a histogram is going to show me the left side up against the wall, which is the shadows, the right side up against the wall for the highlights. Now, everything in between there is based on what the tonal values are in the scene. So uh, the, the ups and downs don't mean a thing unless you have studied light enough to know that this part of light, this brightness here, it should be somewhere on a histogram. I sure as hell don't know that. Um, so using a histogram to determine your exposure is is worthless. Um, it, you know, the only thing it's good for is telling you if your highlights are blown out. And then you have to decide, okay, my highlights are blown out. I don't want them to be, so I need to darken the picture. Uh, other than that, it can't help you with your uh, exposure. So don't let it fool you into thinking it, it does. Uh, the, the best way to make sure you have a proper exposure is, is BLH, bracket like hell. Try a whole bunch of different exposures. Now, if people are, if you have people in the shot or animals or something moving, you can't bracket. You got to pick one and go with it and stick with it. And uh, and so, as I'm out shooting, you know, I I have to worry about what's my depth of field, what's my shutter speed, select my aperture, my shutter speed based on that, whether something's moving or not, and then. Uh, Pray like hell that my exposure is close. Now, one of the good thing about the newer digital cameras is if you're off a stop or two, you can save it. Um, and depending on on the camera and how good you are in post processing, uh, you can probably make a picture look pretty darn good that was that you missed the exposure on. So, you know, that's why I don't carry a gray card because if I'm off uh, you know, half a stop, I'm I'm close enough probably probably. Uh, I've, I've known photographers who said they can tell when they're a 16th of a stop off on their exposure. I called bullshit on that, but they, they claimed they could. Um, they were, you know, one guy I knew really well uh, was a studio photographer. He did a lot of product work. And if he was a 16th of a stop off, colors on his products would be wrong and he'd be in trouble. So 
He, I believe, uh, everybody else, eh, 16th of a stop. If you can t if you can see the difference in that, good for you. I can't, doesn't make any difference. And so to me, all there is to it is let's get it really, really close. And then if we have to fix it in post, we can, but I don't want to. I don't want to fix my exposure in post because bad things happen. And so basically that's all there is to it. Anybody have any questions, thoughts? Talk now. I, yeah, I find uh, that uh, I can pretty well tell how bright or dark my picture will be since I use a mirrorless digital camera. Uh, well, that that still won't probably that still won't be entirely accurate, especially in the sun uh, bracket like hell. Well, because if you bracket like hell, well, one of them will be right. So even though I can pretty well tell how bright it will be, but there. There's still some margin for for it not being what you thought. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, your your the screen on your back of your camera is affected by how bright it is outside too. So if you're in bright sunlight, it'll look different than if you're in the shade or at night, especially. And so, at, especially at night, uh, you'll look at your screen and it'll say it'll it'll seem like oh that exposure is pretty good, and you take it back and you put it in the computer and it's dark as hell. You barely see anything. Yeah, so that's a good. Point. Yeah, you can't trust this. You can't trust the screen. So a uh, bracket like hell. So how many stops do you bracket in both directions from what you think the exposure is? Right. Right. How many stops do you bracket in both directions? Depends on how far off I think I am. Three stops, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I do a one picture of one stop, one picture at two stops, one picture at three stops. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I usually know which way I need to go, uh, whether brighter or darker. If I don't have a clue, I just do it both ways. You know, go three stops overexposed, two stops overexposed, one stop overexposed, one right on. And mm -hmm. and also that way, if you have a a a really tough scene if you have those five sh or seven shots you can put them together in software with hdr software and and uh even out the the uh the tones but uh you know some things you can do that for if nothing's moving if you're photographing wildlife you can't do hdr yeah because wildlife moves right i'm just going through the chat now uh, is there any questions on chat that I missed? No. So, uh, and uh, I guess you uh, uh, see how bright or dark it is in the viewfinder, and then you go uh, some stops one way or both ways in case. Well, you're... what what you're seeing in your viewfinder though is a JPEG based on whatever you have your camera set up for so right right, right. so any other questions really... or thoughts yeah um yeah I, I do very different i do very well i say that i do a lot of street i did some street photography i also do a lot of stage photography so stage photography is probably quite different in lots of ways and you're looking um I would be looking at the microphone area if I'm if I'm photographing the lead singer, and I normally give or take round about the microphone is probably roughly the right kind of exposure, give or take. So I do a spot meter from the microphone, and we're not far away. Everything else falls into shape, in theory, except if they have a light and sometimes get a bit of shadow on the face, underneath the chin, which is. You know, not great, but sometimes you can get away with it. But but yeah, that's all really. But yeah, um, I shoot in spot meter. I shoot spot meter. I think, well, all the time basically. I'd never change it, quite frankly. Yeah. So um, so if you're shooting something yeah. on a stage and they have a spotlight on them, uh, mm. that light's going to be consistent the whole all night. Well, yeah, in theory, in theory, so in theory. You figure out what your proper exposure bit, yeah. is, and then you go yeah. to manual. And you stick with that, and and no matter what happens, as long as they're in the spotlight, it's going to be the right exposure. 
Yeah, and you can lift up, you can lift down or come down or come up a little bit if you need to, if they change the light slightly, you can, you know. And I, and my starting point in stage lighting is about 1600 ISO. That's my starting point. If it's a really good light, I can get down to 800. I haven't seen that often. So I would say my starting point is 16, then I probably hovering between 16 and 3002 ISO. And with today's technology in Lightroom and things, we can get a lot of grain out. And there's not that much grain. Actually, the Fuji film. Yeah, the Fuji, but your dynamic um, range has dropped down dramatically when you're. Yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you're correct on that. Um, it has a little bit, but I can live with that. I don't mind okay. a, a dark background, yeah. to be honest. So I see a question in the chat about the Quichi Balloon Fest this weekend. Even in the morning, you would still use ISO 100. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I yeah. will. <laughs> um, yep. Uh, I'll be shooting probably wide open, uh, but uh, but I, I need that, that uh, the quality of, of uh, ISO 100. And then there's a question about why not auto ISO, uh, because you lose control of your quality with auto ISO. Mm -hmm. You can you can set a limit on how high it will go, uh, which if you if you like auto ISO, please please set a limit on it so it doesn't go streaming up to 385,000 ISO, uh, because your pictures are going to look like crap. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, again, depending so on what you're doing. Uh, auto iso just you know you don't have any control over basically the the noise that is induced by iso so so what are your thoughts on like a lot of the new cameras my camera has quote a dual base io base iso so it's 64 and 500 have the same noise characteristics. Have you tested it? Um, yes, not extensively, but it's, I mean, so I end up shooting, if I'm not on a tripod, I end up shooting a lot at ISO 500. And, and you know, when I'm on a tripod, then I go down to 64. But the, the performance seems to be pretty good at 500. Yeah. So I would do a series of tests, uh, yep. you know, very uh, uh, high contrast light and mm -hmm. see if if the noise in the shadows increases as you go up and also what happens to the dynamic range as you go up. If it's, you know, I'm a huge believer, you know, I see these reports that, that guys do or gals uh, using a densitometer and a spectrometer and some other tometer mm -hmm. and you know they're shooting these numbers at me that don't mean a thing and for me it's can i see a difference you know right I'm gonna set a test if i can't see any difference between iso 100 and 500 hell yeah shoot 500 if you can see a difference yeah. then you need to know that and then you right. make a decision do you know are there times when i have to go to iso too much yes uh, I was in Namibia last fall and and a uh, herd of elephants came through and the sun had gone down and I ended up shooting at ISO 6400 or, or higher mm -hmm. and and I have a gorgeous picture that I have printed at 60 inches uh, you know I was shooting at a 15th of a second handheld with a 500 millimeter lens and my yeah. ISO was cranked as high as I knew I could go without getting golf balls for noise. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd done a test, so I knew that camera at ISO 6400 would give me an acceptable photo, mm -hmm. a situation where I had no other choice. Uh, yep. You know, I was in a safari vehicle, I couldn't get out my tripod. So, yeah, knowing, you know, a simple test shooting ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 32, 6400, and look at the pictures on a big computer monitor and see what the difference is and see where the limit is that you want to go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so somebody said, please comment on the following. A, the, the camera screen is a JPEG great rendition and not. So when you're looking through the camera, it's not. But the, the, when you preview or review uh, the image, when you're chimping, you're seeing a JPEG. 
that JPEG has had uh, saturation added to it. It's had sharpened added to it. It's had all kinds of things added to it, which is why your JPEGs, even if you dump them in your computer, if you shoot JPEG and RAW both, the JPEGs look better than your RAW photos because they've been uh, pre-processed for you. Yeah, so, but um, a mirrorless camera, though, with the EVF is also a JPEG. If you got a DS, DSLR, then you're looking at... Not your live view. No, but your EVF in a mirrorless camera is also a JPEG. Pretty sure. Not, not, it, it's not while, when you, after you take a picture and, and you review it, it is, but while you're looking through the, say you're looking through the camera or, or the back of the screen, it's not creating a series of JPEGs that you're looking at. You know, essentially when you're, you know, you're, you're looking at video, yep. that's not JPEG. Uh, another question, do you use ETTR, ex which is exposure to the right as a general guide for workable exposure in digital cameras? No, that's a hoax. Um, <laughs> uh, if you blow out your, your highlights, you're done. You can't bring them back. Uh, you want to, you know, you, do you want to expose so you have... Uh, the most dynamic range and the most tones possible, then yeah, you keep your exposure to, right to the point where you're not blowing out the highlights, but you don't want to go to the point of of uh, making those highlights too too bright, too white, because there's no detail there and you can't get it back. If you underexpose, odds are pretty good you can bring out some detail in that underexposed area. Uh, it might be noisy, it might be ugly, but you can get something. Uh, our, our eyes, uh, thanks to Kodachrome, are used to seeing uh, shadows as being dark, but highlights that are too white just uh, uh, annoy us. So we're, we're better off having things a little too dark than too light overall. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I never bought into that ETTR stuff. How do you know exposure is correct for printing? That's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> um, that, that is a, a uh, calibration between your monitor, your printer, um, and, and what you're looking at. Uh, you know, when I'm traveling, I'm using a, an Apple MacBook laptop, and those screens are way too bright and way too vivid. And, and whenever I process my photos on one of those, I as soon as I get home, I put them into my desktop computer with a uh, calibrated screen and tone down the tone down the colors, tone down the brightness. Um, but it's uh, um, it, it it it's a a whole other ball game printing. Uh, if you print your own, it's easier to figure out. You'll waste a lot of paper and ink. But if you're using a uh, print service, a lab, they have Profiles you can download, hopefully, if it's a good one, and uh, and and be able to match up what you're doing, what you're seeing with what the printer's seeing. And a printer will never see all the colors that your screen sees, so you'll never get all of that together. Do you use? Do you find topaz denoise useful, or is that to be avoided? Um. Uh, uh, I have, it. I don't use Topaz Denoise too much. Um, I, I find that Lightroom's uh, new Denoise is, does marvelous things. Um, the elephant shot I was telling you about from Namibia, I did throw it through Topaz Denoise to give it a little less noise and it worked really nice. Um, I, I use Topaz Sharpen quite a bit, uh, but I want to I know I don't want to do a lot of post processing. I don't want to sit in front of the computer, so I'm using Lightroom as much as I can, and the denoise in it works really, really well. Uh, if I have an, a, a picture that is uh, really horrible, then I might have to jump over and try in another thing. But I find that 95% of what I'm doing, uh, Lightroom is handling quite well, or Photoshop. And uh, but again, at least. 85% of my photos are shot at ISO 100, and I'm not worried about noise at all. 
So if ISO is used, ISO 100 is used in the morning at the balloon festival with evaluative metering, do you recommend underexposing by a stop? It depends where the light is and, and what the metering is telling me. Um, I know people who shoot aperture priority and set their exposure compensation to minus one for all the time. Well, if, if you know. If you do that and and suddenly you're shooting against a bright sky, then you're really going to have a dark, dark picture. So it it just totally depends on the light and and the angle of the light and the background and what the light's falling on and and all of that. So uh, right. do you uh, get the exposure from how bright it looks through the viewfinder or some other method before you then do bracketing? Maybe you have a a light meter that recommends an exposure. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll let the camera give me a ballpark where to start. Um, I'll, but uh, you know, I've, I've shot enough pictures that I can walk into a room or walk outside and tell you what the exposure is and be, be within a stop. Uh, because for years, I literally didn't use a light meter. 60 to 80% of the time, aperture priority is gonna get you the proper exposure, right? I can't lose 20 to 40% of my shots because my exposure's off, right? So I'm going to be in manual exposure to maintain that exposure as close as possible. You know, if, if I'm only hitting, you know, 80% of my exposures right, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble, right? Because this is how I feed my face. And obviously it gets lots of food. So you know, I, I've got to have my exposure pretty close all the time. So that's why I'm, you know, making sure that I'm controlling it, not the camera, as far as what the proper setting is. Okay, anybody, anything right. else? Thank you, have a good night.